that. So, would you um, tell us how you came about this idea? What prompted you and Craig to start a collection? Well, you know, uh, like most collections, you start collecting things one at a time, and then one day you wake up and you find uh, you've got a museum sitting in your home in closets, garages, and we found ourselves in that situation and then uh, decided that uh, we were just going to open up a contact lens museum. How long did it take you to curate the collection in here? A long time and we, that's an ongoing endeavor. Um, you know, trying to do something of this magnitude while you're working full time and everything else, uh, got full curriculum and back there, it's, um, it's, it's been very busy, but as you can see, um, it's just such a joy. It just brings so many smiles to so many faces when you bring older practitioners <laughs> through here yeah, the, because the relic in. Yeah, right, it really <laughs> it's so true. Why don't you me? Yeah, that's right. Uh, we'll put you in the chair. There you go. That won't be creepy at all. <laughs> no, it won't be creepy at all. But no, you're so right. It's just uh, so many memories that come back to all of us that were touched by contact lenses. You know, it's uh, when you think about how contact lenses have changed so many people's lives and changed their lives. All those keratoconus patients, and irregular cornea patients. It's it's humbling, you know, to you know be a part of you know having this history. So we we felt that you know. I was a younger patient. When did you get your lenses? You were nine years nine old. Nine years old. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Probably when the younger contact lenses were. Yeah. You know, there in so many millions of people's lives have been changed so much with these. Now, when practitioners have anything lying around their basements or garages or the oh. back room of their practices, mm -hmm. would you be interested from, in hearing from them? Yes, we'd be very interested. That's where we pick up a lot of these relics. Mm -hmm. um, every practitioner, literally everyone uh, out there has one or two items that have been given to them by an elderly patient or uh, they took over a practice that you know had been established back in the 30s or mm -hmm. 40s. And somewhere in their archives uh, are these treasures, you know, that they've not known what to do with them. They hold on to them because they don't take up a lot of space. But they don't know, where, they know they can't throw it out. Right, of course uh, <laughs> But they, they're looking for a place to send it. This is the place. <laughs> this is the place to send it. So. There, it can be archived, uh, taken care of properly. Um, we've, Craig and I have spent, you know, hours and hours learning about curating um, an optical museum like this. It's, uh, there's a lot that goes into it. We had to then uh, apply for a, um, a nonprofit. Uh, organization, a 501c3 with the government. We uh, got that, so we're official. So not only are you accepting items to be displayed here, you're accepting financial contributions to support yeah, the museum. Yeah, very much so. This has been totally funded uh, through gifts and so on, and by Craig and myself. And oh, that's it. That's a good charity for next year. Absolutely. That is. It really is. It's a lovely charity for uh, individuals in the eye care profession that want to see, you know, the history of uh, contact lenses preserved. So uh, you can see here we uh, uh, encourage donations, and uh, so we, uh, yeah, we love it. You know, when people can, uh, when they win the lottery, you know, send us uh, some of that, and uh, so we have one. But it's, um, we get, uh, believe it or not, our biggest support from uh, patients. So they feel this incredible emotional, you know, tie to these lenses. Sure. Now this is uh, actually just part of the collection. Uh, 
a lot of it still is in storage right now. Uh, we need a, a bigger facility. When we opened this up in July, we opened it up with the knowledge that uh, we've already outgrown it. Uh, it's a good that, problem to uh, have. Good problem to have. And, so we're just going to keep raising, you know, funds as best we can and uh, hope to move into a bigger uh, facility as time goes on. And then this is, like I said, part of the collection. The other collection I'm going to show you is the uh, collection of antique glasses, uh, oh. spectacle lenses, um, probably one of the finest in uh, North America right now. That's across the street at the school. Um, so uh, it's this has been just a passion for Craig and I, you know, this collecting. And, um, fortunately, we have wives that understand uh, the insanity because <laughs> uh, that's what it is. It's truly it's insane to be doing this. Uh, um, uh, but. You know, Craig and I have been blessed so much, like you have, like we all have, by the eye care industry. That, Very much so. Yeah, that it's just been a humbling experience to be a part of it. So this is our payback, or this is our legacy that we'll leave. You know, so. And it's a beautiful one. It's a start. It's, yeah, a, it's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful start. And so we're real happy. Very, very happy with it all. Excellent. So, many, many years ago, as you can imagine, the um, it's really myself and Craig Norman who kind of put this all together. The story begins over here. I'll sort of walk you through. This is kind of the evolution of contact lenses. The, uh, all of these lenses here are made of glass. And so these were the earliest uh, contact lenses in Germany and Zeiss. So they were the three making glass uh, scleral lenses at the time. When did Obrick come in? Obrick came in in the uh, 1940s. How do you know that name? <laughs> I used to live with him. <laughs> oh. oh my. My, I was just uh, <laughs> reading a, a book uh, this morning, uh, his uh, textbook from 1945 uh -huh. on um, contact lenses. It's really one of the earliest. Yeah. And uh, that is what a coincidence. So all yeah, of are these companies related? It's it's no, Muller Sohn no, and Muller Welt. No, they were different um, families. Okay. Yeah, they had no uh, no relation. And uh, so these, uh, like I said, it's the largest collection of glass uh, contact lenses in the world. Hmm. So it's um, they're hard to find. They're very rare. Uh, wonderful to feel because they're incredibly heavy. Can can I touch one? Yeah. As a matter of fact, you can touch the one that is yours. Uh, <laughs> we wanted Craig and I wanted you to have this. This is a glass uh, really? Stolero lens. Wow. And uh, it's all the contributions you've made to the industry, you deserve that. Oh, you are so <laughs> kind. Thank you. Yeah, it's, Look at this it's thing. kind of neat to have. You can see kind of how rough the optics were. Very rough. And, uh, but, you know, they got better with time. Mm -hmm. That's a real early one. Like Which so, year? Uh, this would have been probably early 1900s. Wow. So between 1900 and 1910. But you could feel how smooth uh, yeah. the glass The workmanship was, was wonderful. But, um, yeah, it's, uh, that's definitely one we wanted you to have. That's very nice. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Yeah. This would be a real challenge to apply and to remove. Yeah, it really, it really is because of the size. Um, these were about 24. 
22 to 24 millimeters in diameter. So they were pretty big. And then I see that they're fenestrated as Some well. Some of them were, and that's kind of unique, the number of them that were fenestrated. Um, you can imagine drilling a hole in glass can be a little bit challenging. And, a lot of breakage. Uh, yeah. But uh, I'm always surprised when I'm going through the lenses, the number of them that have uh, actually been fenestrated. And that would have been a challenge as well, not only drilling the hole, but making sure that the edges are smooth enough. Because oh, yes. That would have been quite painful had you applied a yeah. fenestrated lens that wasn't smooth. But then you look at these Zeiss lenses, the optics are absolutely perfect, and they're incredibly thin. And I always wonder how many of those broke in the eye, you know, it wouldn't take much trauma. That would have been to a shatter really good those, problem. yeah. But that was unique of the Zeiss lenses at the time. Um, they uh, they were incredibly thin. Do you know who made this one? The one that you gave me? Uh, that one, yes, I do. That one uh, was uh, from the uh, Mueller Weld Company. Wow. Yeah, that one. Look from at these. There. And then so those are the molds right those there? Those are the molds. So that and is let brass. Me, let and me then take you through how, let's say like it's uh, 1920 and I'm going to fit you with a contact lens. It would all begin over here. Um, May I sit in the chair? Yes, yeah, please. Okay. You sit in the chair again. That's where I sit. <laughs> I get comfortable in here. <laughs> and, um, now the molding process began by just simply mixing this compound. It's called moldite. moldite yeah. And we would mix it in one of these uh, containers and then uh, it would be placed into a syringe. And this mold then would be placed onto the eye and the moldite compound injected through here and then it would take a perfect mold of the anterior segment. So the molding compound would harden in about 90 seconds. So you had to be real efficient with your time. You had to load this, inject it, and uh, be pretty efficient. So you have to do that on a board exam, right? right? Yeah, absolutely. Nineteen fifties. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. And. Uh, then uh, what happened next was when you had that beautiful mold, you would mix this next compound called cast stone. And that cast stone then uh, was just like a, um, a concrete, but incredibly fine powdery concrete. And then you would let it harden and uh, then you would have this beautiful impression of the eye. Now, back in the day, in the, before World War II, a second mold would have to be made of brass. And the reason for that is that when the lens was actually turned into a contact lens, it um, was made of glass, and the glass would just simply, the heat of the glass would destroy the, the moldite, so it had to be turned into a brass mold. Then it was taken over here, and this is probably the highlight of the museum in the fact that we have the only remaining glass contact lens making apparatus in the world. This really? is it. This is the only one left. Does it work if it you works. wanted to create a lens? Oh, you yeah. Can't... Yeah, we've had it fired up, and you can see we've destroyed part of the uh, table from the firing <laughs> it up, and uh, uh, it makes a lot of pops and noises. And Now, there was a, this vice was on the stand. We don't know what its function was, but uh, it must have had some function. The problem with this instrument is that Nowhere can we find anything written on how to manufacture the contact lens or how they were manufactured. Wow. So we're having to piece it together little by little. Now, the um, 
If I push this, is something going to happen? Yeah, push oh, it. Push it? Yeah, push both of them. Uh, this one. Oh my and God. It still works. That's the amazing thing. We fired up these motors and um, uh, they were still working. Uh, this is incredible. So, uh, they, uh, now, the way it worked was you attach the mold, the brass mold of the shape of the eye here. Top two, I think. Perfect. Now, that bottom, yeah, no, you got it. You got them both. Okay. Good. And what would happen is you uh, had natural gas and oxygen that were mixed together. Those were, um, it wasn't propane. Propane hadn't been invented yet, so they actually used natural gas wow. back in that day. And so the gases were then mixed up here to the appropriate concentration, and these valves controlled the amount of oxygen versus the... Uh, amount of natural gas. It looks like it's a very non-precise process. Exactly, exactly, very non-precise. Then they had these two by two wafers of glass uh, that were set right here. And then this was just simply brought around once the glass had been molten and this just brought down and an impression made of the uh, contact lens. And that's the mold right there. That's the mold. So you would of swap that eye. out depending upon the yeah. patient you're creating this for. And then in this little container, when I got the instrument, uh, it was just filled up to about here with asbestos. Oh, excellent. So that uh, made it all complete. Uh, so then you would bring it back here, drop this mold. And because it was flaming hot from uh, being in contact with the glass, and it would fall into the asbestos where it would be cooled. And now, with these little tools here, the residual glass would be broken away. And then you saw over here how the edges were rounded and then the power placed on the front of the lens with, uh, with this. Now, the only thing we can think of here is that this was actually operated by hand the, to oscillate the uh, application of the power on the front side of the lens. That's all we can actually kind of surmise. We don't know how else it was driven. And, uh, but everything came with the unit, it was intact, and it's actually from, of all places, Perth, Australia. Don Ezekiel. Yeah, Don Ezekiel. And, and if anybody would have something like this, it would be it'd him. be him. And uh, you'll see as you go through the museum, many of the pieces are from Don's collection and that was probably the largest in the world. And he gave it all to us. So we're really super fortunate to have that. And he got his basement back. I'm sorry? He got his basement back. Yes, <laughs> and he had his garage. He had, uh, had it in his laboratory, but when he sold the laboratory, it went moved into his garage. So he was kind of uh, grateful that Again, sad to see it all go away. And, uh, but to have the only one remaining. Uh, now this is for this. <laughs> <laughs> A mechanical tool then, nothing yeah. to do with creating the contact no, lens. No, no, <laughs> just strictly for changing out the gas. If you wanted to? Is there gas in there? Could no. you make one? No, we uh, we keep the uh, the live ones in my garage at home, uh, <laughs> but these are uh, actually empty. And so you uh, have filled ones if you wanted oh, to. Yes. I mean, I don't know that oh, I put asbestos there, sure. but you could create oh, yeah, a glass yeah. lens. We're the only ones in the world that can make glass contact lenses. If you need one, 
Have you tried it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we've tried it, and it's incredible. Just there's a lot of experimentation getting the temperature right, getting the just the exact amount of uh, natural gas and the exact amount of oxygen. But you could see that it uh, would be very easy to, uh, to accomplish. Now, when PMMA came along, things changed rather dramatically because now it was possible to just simply use the mold itself rather than turning it into a brass mold. And what was used at that time then were these PMMA wafers. That's actual PMMA? Yeah. I thought now, it was cardboard. No, it's, it's, it has this protective coating on it, and you just peel this away, and then there's this beautiful piece of acrylic plastic. Wow. For scleral lenses. That's really cool. Very cool. And now, you know, it didn't take any temperature at all to melt that. You know, you, that was not like melting glass. So I think we may even have one here that might be, yeah, there we go. Oh, so that's so, it. That's it. So did I ask the question good. when you were in school? Did you ever see anything like this? Yes, well, with, with the way it worked in school, <laughs> our, our contact lens course was one person with keratoconus that was handed down from class to class. <laughs> and we had a, it was at Columbia University, and we had Isidore Finkelstein was the professor, a very bright guy, but that was it. And he had this one guy, and every time they had to do something to wash the lens or something, there was no sink. Fink, the Fink used to walk in to the bathroom and wash it and try it on, and this guy never succeeded, but he kept coming back from class to class, oh. and that was <laughs> the contact lens course in the 50s. Oh my gosh, that's so interesting you mentioned that name. I read his name for the first time last night, uh, Fickelstein yeah. from Columbia University, and the reason I came across it, I was uh, doing a story, as I'll show you down here, on Dennis England, who helped invent the first corneal contact lens. But uh, I came across an article written by Hank Knoll from Bosch and Lowe on uh, this gentleman from, uh, from Columbia University. And it was the first time I had seen his name. And so it was really yeah, so that, that was the kind of neat. That was the contact lens course. Oh, wow. my period. <laughs> End of story. And then whatever you learn happened afterwards. Yeah. It happened afterwards. But the academy required... In order to become a diplomate, you had to be able to fit a, a scleral lens, lens and using moldite. Yeah. And oh. what happened, yeah, as basically we smuggled in some anesthetic because there's no way you can put that shit in your eye. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. And say, stay still now. Because you so, can imagine if the patient's eye was moving right. during the molding process, you know, you have a pretty bad mold. Yeah, I mean, so... <laughs> what year did you earn your, uh, your diploma? In 1965, I think. And so that was being required at that yeah, time? Yeah, it was a very large class. Uh, the, the word was, you better get it now because it's going to get much tougher to do. But that particular part was separating the men from the boys because you had to learn not only to do it, but then to adjust it. And yeah. Then, uh, and I was always very unhandy. I figured I'd cut my hand off with the burrs yeah. that, that they used. Um, oh, my. So, uh, Wonderful. <laughs> so we yeah. have glass lenses. Glass lenses and then... Yeah. Uh, we, oh, boy. Irv Borish and I was, suffered. Oh, <laughs> my. <laughs> so here we go to PMMA sclerals. PMMA sclerals. And, you know, it was a very... Uh, plastic was very slow to get involved into the evolve into the contact lens industry. It was only after World War II that plastic really did replace glass. Yeah, as World War II. Huh. Yeah. Plastic started first started on airplanes. Mm -hmm. I see up there 
Ernst Abbey. Yeah, Ernst Abbey. Does that have anything to do with the Abbey value? Yep, it sure does. <laughs> that is it right there. He was the mathematician, uh, the brains behind the Carl Zeiss Corporation. And um, he was a brilliant mathematician. He developed this machine right here. This um, was it's like a, an early lensometer? It, it looks like an early lensometer, but it's called a refractometer. And what it did is just measure the index of refraction of huh. the glass. Huh. And because when they were manufacturing glass at the time, they could never control the index of refraction of it. Uh, so each piece had a different index. and. So what they had to do is read the index of refraction and then they knew what radius to put on the front to create the power. There was a lot of math involved. There was a ton of math involved back in those days. Wow. And, uh, but he was the one who really kind of uh, was at the forefront of that. Now I see back here there are corneal lenses as well as scleral lenses. Yeah, it's just like um, um, CDs and uh, VHSs. <laughs> you know, there's that time uh, in space where the two cross over, mm -hmm. and um, this was uh, really it in the 1950s. Uh, it was unsure which of the two modalities was going to really take over. Was it going to stay scleral or was it going to go corneal? And so you see a number of these fun sets that have actually both in them. Now here's the uh, Theo Ulbricht sets uh, out of New York. Uh, the one in the back was the original Theo Ulbricht uh, scleral lens set. And then the one in the front uh, is one of the later uh, sets. I like these glasses down here. The world of contact lenses. That is that really is cool. Bizarre. So um, W.J. made them. Well, Newton Wesley uh, was the man responsible for kind of bringing contact lenses into the mainstream. Uh, so in the, the early 1960s, he marketed everything uh, to get contact lenses out to the masses. God bless him. Yep, and uh, he appeared on the Steve Allen show, <laughs> and he was just this incredible kind of showman, but yet incredibly ethical. And, um, I yeah, never, he was keratoconic. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Do you have any stories? Well, yeah, he and he had a partner, George Jessen, mm -hmm. yeah. and George was a, a glad hander type of salesperson, and Newton was the front front guy with the research type of thing. Right. And uh, they they did everything, and they not only the market glasses, but I remember they used to hand out ties. Oh, I've got one. Christmas. Oh, it says contact lenses on it. Yes, I'm so, so funny you should make that you're the only one I've ever known right there uh, oh, from the uh, Newton oh, Wesley yeah. Company. And, uh, but he, he was just this incredible marketer. Yes. And it was just so cool what he was able to do. That's good. Somebody needs to get the word out. Well, you know, and a uh, little known fact, it was Newton Wesley who founded Pacific University College of Optometry. Is that right? I didn't yeah, know that. Yes. He, uh, it's a rather kind of long and sometimes sad story because um, he founded it uh, but then had to give it up and sell it uh, because of uh, World War II and the internment camp. So his two sons and his wife ended up in a, an internment camp uh, throughout the, the course of World War II. And uh, it was here in Portland where the internment camp was. And um, uh, Roy Wesley, his son, is still alive. And um, he is on our board of directors of the museum because he's this incredible historian of uh, that era uh, of the internment camps and all the 
kind of injustices done uh, back then. So fi kind of a fun story to just uh, hear him talk about. Oh, and, I bet. Um, about his life growing up as a child in, in the camp. Right. So, and then um, over here, um, we have a couple other items. Uh, one is the Micon. This was the first commercially available contact lens solution that went into the back of a scleral contact lens. Oh, what is Micon? And, um, you know, it, it's, I'm not sure, I think it's a sodium bicarbonate uh, uh, system. What does it say there? I looked oh, it up. Oh, 2% sodium. Go. You were yeah, right. I was. Sodium bicarbonate solution. So where did the name Micon come uh, from? Now, that I don't know. It was manufactured by House of Vision in Chicago. House of Vision. <laughs> House of Vision, yes. It sounds like a sketchy place. It does. It, 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 like a haunted place. <laughs> now, uh, next to it here is another one of those Wesley Jessen things. This was a research lens. Um, and... Uh, Patients were losing their lenses um, pretty easily when they switched to corneal. So what they did is they impregnated the contact lens with little uh, graphite particles. Uh, and then you would just pick it up with a magnet or Are find it. Are you kidding it. me? Yeah, so it was a magnetic. A magnetic contact, contact lens. Contact lens. And that's what it's actually stuck to is the magnet right there. Oh my gosh. Did that affect vision by having no, that into the no, plastic? It, it's sort of like putting fenestrations in the lens. They never really affected acuity very much, and uh, just a clever idea. So, but they never marketed it or anything, but it's just kind of cool to have a one of their... magnetic lens. Wow. Some magnetic. patients may like to have that option available to them. Oh, gosh, I thought it was so clever, you know. But it just shows you, you know, you've got a problem, uh, you know, this is how we're going to fix it. Who was the optician that brought the, I forgot his name, that brought, made the corneal lens popular? Who was? Oh, Kevin Tui? Tui, yeah. Yeah. The Tui lens. Kevin Tui. That was the first one. We've got some of his early uh, things over here as we evolve from. It took lids of steel to adapt to them. That's for <laughs> sure. Uh, the, then we went from the sclerals into the. Uh, oh, we have a, a Tui contact lens fitting record back there. Yes. Yes, now that's kind of interesting. That's Robert, uh, Robert Ryan. Uh, Ryan. Now, Is that I a HIPAA violation, Pat? Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a definite <laughs> HIPAA violation. Now, he was a famous actor oh, sure. uh, back in the 50s. And, um, and uh, another the, famous person that's was Ronald Reagan. Ronald mm, Reagan. Was yep. He wore contact lenses. Wore contact lenses. So we have some pretty interesting things. Oh, so here's the little scandal, I guess, with Dennis England. His, he yes. tried to, he applied for the first U.S. patent. In 1945, right. I've got the original patent. Uh, Craig, um, I've got a Xerox copy, but Craig has uh, contacted the patent office, and we're going to see if we can get the original patent, uh, that patent application. And Kevin Tui um, preceded him. Yeah. Uh, oh no no no. Sorry. Followed. Okay. Uh, he followed him by uh, two years, one month. Um, was uh, two years later, Kevin Tui took out his patent or applied for his patent. That was uh, in the fifties, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Nineteen fifty. And then Bill Feinblum also. Got kind of involved with scleral lenses. Yeah, and there's Bill's uh, diagnostic <laughs> set. Yeah, You'll notice was. those green lenses there, and uh, apparently someone told me that uh, those were actually developed for treatment of an eye stigmas. Huh. Now, Did uh, it work? That I have yeah. no idea. <laughs> no. Uh, yeah, I, wouldn't, I didn't know why it would work. Again, I wish uh, Bill was still alive. And, uh, you know, there's a, a, there's a Yiddish expression, it worked like a Teuton Bankus, like a, a leech on a dead person. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so did you know Feinblum? Oh, sure. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah we used to, 
We used to work together. He was the man. Yeah, he was, yeah. uh, Bill, uh, what happened towards the end, he, uh, he, he couldn't handle the contact lids, so he referred to us. Hmm. But he was a tremendous promoter, and his main specialty was low vision. Yeah. Hmm. Right. And he was able to get his, his, his face on, on Life magazine, hmm. yeah. and he ended up having a tremendous practice on Park Ed, and again, the low vision didn't work. But it was, it was, but people kept coming, kept coming I've got in. that Life magazine with that his story, <laughs> the Fine Bloom story. It's yeah. actually one of the really earliest uh, he, he publications. Yeah, he was well. Actually, there's <laughs> a direct link with, between Bill promoting and me. <laughs> Afterwards, oh, so, my. so I shouldn't I shouldn't knock him. This machine, the Yeah, it's the only one I've ever seen. It. Um, Again, another WJ product uh, from the 1960s, and you turn those dials, and it would bring you would build your contact lens. Each one of those dials uh, put on a different radius of curvature. Wow! So you design both the anterior and posterior surface of the lens with that little. They call it computer, but it's just roller um, device and. Um, it's a very, very cool thing, but... Did you ever um, use one? No, never used one. Uh, it's the only one I've ever seen. Yeah, and, those, uh, those tinted lenses are also very interesting. Yeah, those are from change England. Your, yeah. Change your eye color. Yeah, <laughs> Caprice <laughs> PMMA we lenses. Had, is, oh, God. Somebody needed his eye color changed. Yeah. I forgot his name already. Well, I recognize something George, down George there. George Siegel. Oh, the actor, yeah. So George he came in, you know, he, was, he, was, he was young, and he had to play an Arab. He had blue eyes. So he had to play an Arab in some sort of film he was in. So Columbia Pictures sent him in. He, he was in New York in those days. So we had to give him one of those lenses. So I gave him the lenses, and I gave him a bottle of anesthetic. He <laughs> 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 shooting because he, yes. he suffered with them. They were thick, and they were terrible. Oh, so he had to have dark eyes. Shoot. Did so. you see the movie afterward? No. 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 Maybe it didn't even come out. I don't know. <laughs> yes, it could be. <laughs> was many, yeah, many maybe don't didn't. make it. I see a bottle of Playa Gel down there. I haven't yes. heard of that oh name in a long yes. time. Uh, Playa Gel, and then the ones behind it, the yellow ones, are called LC65. Um, they were uh, big items back in the 60s for PMMA. And what happened in the 50s and low 60s, early 60s, these lenses were very thick. And somebody came up with the idea of what if we fenestrate them? And they put four little holes in, and they called it the vent air contact lens. Yeah. So vent air, and then became, became a marketer for the, for the thing. They did a tremendous amount of advertising, and they ended up with offices all over the country. Wow. They were. Vente was one of them. There was one other company from Chicago that also. Yeah, um, there was a Spiro Vent. Spiro Vent had and, one. Uh, you just happen to have some of it right here. <laughs> yes, yes. Some of the, here's an original Tui uh, brochure. And uh, let's see, I don't know if I have my vent there out there. See, no, I guess I don't. After that, the lenses were so thick that the people were terribly uncomfortable, and that's when I went into practice. Mm. And Ted, my partner, worked for Ventair down the street. Oh boy! And he sent people over to yeah. me, and then we came up with the bright idea. Says, "Hey, if they're so uncomfortable with thick, why don't we make a thinner lens?" Oh boy! So we formed a company called Micro Thin Contact Lenses, and we got one Orthodox Jew to work in Brooklyn in a lab, uh -huh. and he was the micro-thin maven. He oh was the one that, that did it, and we had a thinner lens. And because we had a thinner lens, we were able to succeed where, micro, where Ventair failed. So we built up a very large Fantastic. PMMA practice in those years. How did Ventair feel about Ted? <laughs> they didn't know he worked for us. <laughs> and then after that, after that <laughs> He left there because the practice got big enough that right. we were able to... Now, to over him. on in this cabinet is the uh, early evolution of soft lenses. Mm -hmm. uh, soft lenses were developed by that gentleman there, Otto Wichterly in Prague, Czechoslovakia. 
he started working on uh, the material in the early 1960s. He actually started producing contact lenses in 1966, and those were the first soft lenses. They were called SPOFA, S-P-O-F-A, SPOFA lenses. Right there, right in front of you is the first soft contact lens brochure ever <laughs> produced. That was in 1965. Um, and um, these uh, lenses here uh, really do represent the first key mount for first soft contact lenses. I've got one hydrated there. The rest are stored dry. Wow. Um, the, um, very kind of neat to have those as part of the collection. These were the original SPOFA cases from 1966. And um, about the same time, uh, a company in upstate New York and Toronto uh, started this uh, Bionite company, uh, which was a Griffin lens. Oh, I've never um, heard of that. Yeah, that um, was the... Um, a high water content lens. It had about a 55% water, but you see it um, goes back to that same time frame as the Otto Wichterly uh, lenses. Oh, and there it says they were purchased by AO. Yep. And, and then, then became Softcon. Yep, and then became Softcon, exactly. And then NPB and L marketed them very differently. They had uh, salespeople and the first sales manager insisted that all their salespeople come in with dark suits. Uh -huh. So they were very, very formal, Very unique. Very, <laughs> and very businesslike yeah. with, uh, with the Bausch and Lomb lens. Oh, and now so we're into the salt tablets and heat units. Salt tablets and then heat units. Uh, oh, yeah, this the is the, uh, the scepter unit. range of the scepter units. The first one you see right here was the original Bosch and Lohm one, uh, 1971. The FDA had no idea on how to disinfect these soft contact lenses, so this is what Bosch and Lohm came up with. If um, you look kind of closely, that heater unit there was uh, actually a baby bottle warmer. <laughs> uh, they purchased them from uh, Gerber Baby Food Company and then modified the top lid to hold the contact lens case. So you yep, filled yep. that up, you remember the distilled water oh, that you put in there and, uh, and uh, push a button. And actually it was a marvelous way to sterilize lenses because yeah, after that people, the cold sterilization came in, but unfortunately they put thimerosal hmm. into mm -hmm. the solution. And that and was this one had, right here, this was the first. And the red eyes started. The red eyes started uh, big time. So you'll love these names here, Paul. The uh, normal, flexol, and oh, preflex. Yeah. That will resonate yeah, with you. Names. Those are just so cool. Alcon swirl the, uh, Yes. That sounds like toilet cleaner. <laughs> well, it does sound like Sorry, that. Alcon. The acceptor, the acceptor unit was something that patients had individually. However, the office had very large units. Right. So you can no, take right down here. So there they are. Oh. I remember and, and those that, glass vials. And my that particular on one ended up with a short circuit over a weekend, and our office burned down. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> yeah. They got to turn it off before they They, uh, they lost many so an office fire. with that unit. Wow. And that, was, uh, that was when you met me at the door and said, Dad, you can sleep late tomorrow. And I came yeah, back from the yeah. leisure. <laughs> so, you know, this was, um, uh, you'll notice that a lot of different cleaning systems were developed because at the time we had to make soft lenses last a year. Right. Uh, they were replaced on a yearly basis, so a lot of heroic uh, things were developed to try to well, extend the length of time. The, uh, matter of fact, we had one, one scheme. We met the developer woman who developed the contraceptive sponge. You remember this Seinfeld sponge worthy? Right. It was a contraceptive sponge. I remember that. And it was FDA approved. 
And it had the ability that if you would rub a contact lens on it, you could clean it. And we say, this is what we're going to do. So how did somebody come up with that concept that this is a contraceptive sponge, I'm going to put my contact lens on there? I mean, where did that come from? You say, what? <laughs> I mean, who would think of that? So, <laughs> and the chemicals, because it was a spermicide, yeah, right? So, but, I mean, I wonder what the chemicals yeah, would do so, to so the lens. We, we started dealing with this crazy woman uh, who, who had some company in, in Europe and Germany, and it cost us at least six figures by the time we figured out it's not going to work, and then she conned us, <laughs> and so that, another scheme Okay, so I'm glad to hear that you that talk was... talk about waste, my West Indian land, that was even worse. But So that actually, nobody ever really did that, so she no, no, took we, you we for did. a ride. Okay, I'm yeah, glad to absolutely. hear that. Absolutely. I mean, not that you were taken for a no, ride, no, I'm not I, glad, no, but I that have, nobody was cleaning their lenses on a contraceptive no, no, that, was only, that was only one of the many rides. <laughs> I see CSI lenses back there, yes. and now I... What else did I see? Um, yeah. Lens those, Plus. Now we're getting into things that I remember. Yeah. Those terrible vials that you cut your hand on. Yeah. Yep. And do you have a, there it is. The crimper. Yeah, the, the crimper. crimper. I remember those things. And those oh, very yes. light, uh, the caps. Caps. Uh, that they were, were light and then you put it on and then yeah. when you try to pull it off. Yep. There goes your finger. Yep. And uh, so it, it's just so much fun. Then lenses, I never made it. Uh, the 3M lens. Uh, called the Advent Lens, uh, lasted in the marketplace just a few months, and it was a pure fluorocarbon contact lens, uh, very oxygen permeable. They teamed up with Allergan to promote that lens, but it never made it. Uh, the Epicon uh, was another one that never quite made it in the marketplace. And then the Nike Max site. I remember here. that. Yeah. You have the Sil Soft in there? Sil Soft is right here. Yeah. Yep. Another one that worked beautifully. 100% oxygen permeable, but yeah. way too thick. So yeah. you, it was terribly and uncomfortable. And so hard to remove, yes. too. It was a rubbery yeah. thing. It was Dow, Dow Corning owned it. Yep, and Dow gave Corning, it. way to go. Man, this has got to be weird for you. Yeah. All these things coming back. And <laughs> yep. just, uh, you, you wonder where all that garbage is being stored. You know, I, I always ask myself, where well, is it Are you being kidding? Stored? I mean, I, I've got these Gilbert and Sullivan operettas up here. That, oh, <laughs> my. You know, oh. So, that's, yeah. But I can't remember what happened to them yesterday. Yeah, me right. either. Me either. That's uh, the truth. Well, you've got a DMV in there. Yeah, we do. And, and it looks like you have a designer case. Yeah, we do. It was a short period where Revlon bought out one of these companies. I, I uh, Hydrocurve. Uh, bought out Hydrocurve. Or Barnes Hyde. And they got themselves a really serious PR firm in New York, and they sent me around the country to talk about... Uh, their, their particular product, they were interested in, uh, in, in tinted lenses in those days and changing eye color. And, uh, but they, they got me on morning shows all over the place by using a great PR firm. And that's when you did Phil Donahue. Yeah, you know, Phil Donahue came through that as well. Oh, these you'll remember. Now, these were called medical alert bracelets, and, uh, and they were developed for PMMA lens wearers who had been involved in auto accidents and maybe in a coma because what was happening is people were wearing PMMA contact lenses, they'd be in a two-week coma, they'd finally look at their eyes and find a huge ulcer sitting there. So uh, these medical alert bracelets uh, made everyone aware of the fact that they were wearing contact lenses. And then uh, these old Shiatz tonometers, you'll remember those. Uh, oh, yes. Both you and I were yes. trained on those back sure. in the day. And, wow. Um, really beautiful instruments and um, obviously replaced by applanation tonometry. And uh, wow. so... You know what you need? Oh, you do have it over there. I see uh, you need a, I was looking at this uh, trial lens that you need oh, a yeah. lens cabinet. 
Oh, yes. I have a friend uh, at one of the practices where I worked, and she had one of those old, it was a big piece of furniture oh, with the my. lens. It was oh, beautiful. My. I wanted oh, it. Oh, no. I wanted <laughs> <laughs> Those, I, you know, they sell for a lot of money now, as yeah. you can imagine, because they are just beautiful. And uh, read this uh, Barbie doll. Thing. I saw that. Ooh. Does it? Why do you? Why does it say "Looking for Ken"? Uh, yeah, I, I just put that in there. <laughs> it's a little <laughs> sexist, uh, yeah, Patrick. Yeah, a little, little bit, but. Uh, uh, on, oh wait, on loan from the Craig Norman Barbie doll collection. <laughs> yeah. That's totally awesome. Uh, yeah. We need to find out what other Barbie dolls Craig yeah. has in his collection. Yeah. Yeah. We we really don't know. <laughs> <laughs> And you've got eclipse glasses in yeah, there. Yeah, you know, it's part of our history. Um, 19, or 2017. <coughs> that, was, um, that was really interesting that we had done a story about how to protect your eyes during an eclipse. And there cool. were a lot, there was so much interest drawn during that very short window of time of people talking about that yeah. and, and vision and blindness and looking at oh. the sun. So it was a great... Boy, a great news hook and great PR sure for all of eye care. It was. It was a, um, a wonderful opportunity for eye care to uh, tell the story. And then we have a collection of eye cups mm -hmm. there, and this was kind of the original treatment for blepharitis. And I don't know why it went out of vogue because it's still perhaps one of the better treatments for cleaning the lids and lashes and very popular in the 30s and 40s as you can see a lot of different styles came out and well maybe it will come back into vogue because yes. neti pots are coming back into yeah, vogue yeah, similar know. concept yep yep exactly I mean that looks like patent medicine though what is that McElroy's lotion what is that some of these were mixtures that you would put into the eye cup and uh, not sure what some of these uh, actually had within them, but you'll see in the forefront the uh, bicarbonate uh, soda uh, tablets. That's what was usually used. Baking soda? Um, yeah, yeah. Hmm. And... Uh, This is really cool. And I no. see some uh, instrumentation up here, no, too. it starts over Placido here. Placido discs. Uh, these are all from the early 1900s. These are all keratometers, ophthalmometers. They look like satellite dishes of today. Oh, yes. they there were do. still some in my, in my school. Yeah. yeah. That, Just stuff. like that. And, yeah, that's uh, the one where we yeah. position. You had, to, you had to get the axis on. Yep. And they, they rotate. and. I swear that they could still be used today, you know, uh, the electronics would just have to be redone, but uh, other than that, um, they're um, fully uh, functional. Yeah, there's the old slit lamps too. Yeah, the old slit lamps and, um, you know, you really realize that very little has changed in, in the optics of eye care. Um, optics are just such a fundamental thing. So this is circa unknown for this clock, and I'm guessing 60s. Wow. Yeah, you know, some of this stuff I'm still trying to track down, you know. Um, I need to get out to Bosch and Loam. Uh, so much of the history of optics in of this course. country originated there, and um, I've... Um, been in contact with their curator there, and a lovely person, lovely woman. And American and, Optical still do? Uh, you know, that's the other one. American Optical in Massachusetts, are they still around? That I am not sure of. And uh, if they're still around, AO was a big, big company. And um, then uh, back here, have uh, um, some interesting things. One, this is our uh, uh, little humble um, uh, library. 
what we're trying to do is uh, also get all of the books ever written on contact lenses and um, any articles, um, brochures, anything related to contact lenses uh, we're trying to archive and, and save as well. Does the AOA library have? You know, I'm surprised the AOA does not have a very um, complete collection. Uh, they're, um, uh, I've always been kind of a little taken back by the fact that they haven't taken their kind of the history of optometry a bit more serious. Yeah. And, and um, Indiana also, they have the, the, history, the historical society. Oh, yeah. They should have. Yes, and uh, so we need to get involved with all of those folks. Now this, uh, here's a company you'll remember, um, uh, Milton Roy uh, company. Here's a, it's an American Optical, and uh, this was the original um, inventory system for fitting contact lenses. <laughs> And uh, they came in two diameters, 8.2 and 8.7 diameter lenses, all PMMA. And uh, yeah. then, uh, but still a fairly complete set. So yeah, not many mother, of those. Your mother wore them. Really? She wore PMA for a lot of years. Hmm. And then, uh, of course, this is the bathroom, but of course we had to deck it out with all of this antique uh, <laughs> stuff. And, and uh, so this is, is really quite fun. And um, So really anything historical related to eye care, we, uh, we jump on, uh, Craig and I. This is uh, something you might remember too, the old uh, Leslie Jessen uh, photo periscope, oh, yeah. P-E-K is what it was called, and uh, again that was uh, another WJ product. Projectors I used for many, many years. I know. <laughs> I know. Sure. See, the thing is, is that back in those days, that equipment never wore out. No, it, it's like these old, uh, all these old greens refractors. Yes. Um, you know, they still are 100% functional today. Uh, the, the workmanship that went into all of these instruments was just unbelievable. And then the other thing that was always amazing to me is how heavy all of this stuff, because it was all made with cast iron, uh, especially this chair. Yep. Uh, this is pure <laughs> cast <laughs> iron and um, from the 1950s. And yeah. an old B&L keratometer. Who do you think that? Do you think he'd still work it? I bet you he well, could. No, I mean, it would come is, back to you. Yeah. This is a slip lamp. It's not. Yeah. It's, it's not just. The. Um, and there's the Burton lamp. Yeah, used, the Burton put, lamp. Black light. Yep. People used to use this one I light. thought was very unique. It was on a uh, mobile stand, and uh, you would oh, wheel it around. Pours it in and put up the. Lens. So this is the foropter? Look at how tiny it is. Yeah, that was one of the real early oh, foropters. Now here's one of the original foropters, the Zang foropters, and what you did here is you use your loose lenses mm. and you would put them in here and then your uh, auxiliary lenses, the uh, prism, would fold move into position, Maddox rods, all of these things. So this was the earliest of them. And then uh, they evolved into that one there. Wow. This so this had a joystick already. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is a newer, yeah. newer model. That's a, that's a newer 1950 um, Zeiss. <laughs> 
Never. So you have to yeah, yeah, That's what I had. <laughs> As a matter of fact, most optometrists didn't use one. Mm -hmm. I remember yes. when I was in the uh, in the sixties, I joined the. Uh, I, they put me on the committee, the contact lens committee. There were very few people limited to practice, so even though I was very young, they put me on there. And basically, there was a problem because opticians in those days were the were the leaders in contact lens fit, delivery, fitting, you know, yeah. and delivery. But the optometrist said, no, 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 they, they didn't like that idea. I said, well, you know, what, one thing you could do is make it the state of the art that everyone has to have a slit lamp examination when they, have, when they wear contact lenses. And then the AOA in their wisdom says, we can't do that because some of our, many of our members don't have a slit lamp and you'll estrange them. Yeah. So not only didn't they have sinks in their exam rooms to wash their hands, they didn't have a slit lamp to examine their eyes. <laughs> but people survived. <laughs> yeah, they need it somehow. <laughs> Goes Saturday. Hey, hi. Hi, how are you? Hi. See you tomorrow. You betcha. <laughs> Sounds good. I love it. These... So is this yours or is this the school's? No, this is mine. Mine and Craig's. Wow. Completely. And, uh, now the story here begins actually in all of all places, China. Uh, China was the first uh, country to produce uh, spectacle lenses. And these are some of those early spectacles. Uh, many of them are made of tortoise shell and um, some made of brass. They found their way to Europe, and they think through the uh, adventures of Marco Polo that he actually then kind of brought back the concept. So they were introduced in the late um, uh, 1200s. So Marco uh, Polo brought the concept of eyeglasses, spectacles, in addition to mm -hmm. spaghetti. It's a spaghetti. There you go. <laughs> And both have had a big impact. <laughs> and then um, here are some of the earliest glasses made uh, in this country in the early 1700s. These were made by blacksmiths at the time. And so they're made of iron, but they were shaped and uh, then... Uh, uh, this, these are all from the mid 1700s. So what these, is a wig, what are wig eyeglasses? Wig eyeglasses had these little extenders on them. Uh, you'll notice the little bars, the oh, second bar. to stick in the wig to, to stay on. To stick in the wig. Uh, Interesting. So they were just referred to as wig glasses. And uh, then uh, in the late 1700s, uh, were these models that uh, were available. So we're moving away from the entire round shape. We've got uh, some rectangular shape. Yep, oval. we sure do. Interesting. So yeah. even then, we're getting into different lens shapes. Yep. But still, the jewelers didn't get involved. And you can tell as soon as the jewelers got involved because the frames got incredibly elaborate. They're rimless. Yeah, Is that they rimless? were rimless, but wow. they were they were glass. They're all glass. Plastic hadn't come about until the 1920s, so very very slow on the uptake. Oh, and there's Franklin's bifocal. Yeah, that's an original 1700 uh, Franklin bifocal. Where did you find that? Uh, again, been collecting my entire life, and um, that's incredible. Yeah, yep. Yeah. The only thing that I miss about these glasses, and same thing with the context, you just wish they could talk. Oh, and of just tell us your history, and tell us where you've been, uh, would be just so absolutely fascinating. And then what happened oh, in, in Pinchnez, and then the Oxford frames, uh, very similar. Uh, the Oxford frame used a little spring to hold the, uh, the glasses on the eyes. 
and then it was in the 1920s that plastic first got introduced. Oh, tortoise. And Born tortoise, red. and beautiful, beautiful. You know, you look at some of these from the 20s, and you go, I would wear those. Uh -huh. I mean, those are very cool. I mean, they're just incredibly cool glasses. Wow. And then we have the 30s, and uh, then these were glasses that were called inventory glasses made by American Optical. The doctor would um, buy them in these uh, boxes like this, and then he would put, he or she would put them together. The frames are right there and you can see the different bridge sizes. Mm -hmm. And then the bows that went around the ear were what are called gold-filled um, material. Um, what they were... More expensive. Um, yeah, and you could see these uh, are all gold-filled as well. And, um, and you don't so, have these cases locked? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to edit that part yeah. out. <laughs> <laughs> when, did, when, did male, when did male female glasses start? Hmm. You know, that's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. You know, the, um, it, uh, that's a good question. Because they were the same um, for many, many years. These are just old ads, and uh, then um, a fake spectacle lenses. Mm -hmm. You remember those? Mm -hmm. uh, you remember know, you're, you're... the old a fake spectacle lenses? Oh, yes. uh, how <laughs> thick, and heavy. And, People just couldn't. Uh, yeah. They couldn't get around. Oh. So here are some of the old optics books. We have the Irv Borsch refraction book that you and I were raised on. And uh, that one's actually signed by Irv. Oh, wow. So kind of special. 